Is that comfortable now? Yes, you're aware of your legs, even without moving them. Sometimes you can experience the feelings in your feet, in your calves, or in your knees, and just to wish them well. It's like somebody just comes to see you. And they're kind of people. You feel you can relax in their presence. If you can relax with them, the tightness in the body disappears and healing can happen. The kindness is there to relieve fear and make you feel safe. If somebody cares for you, and that is good. And then you go up to your body, you point to your legs, to your butt, to make sure your butt is comfortable, and it doesn't need to fit it. And then go to your torso. People these days have many diseases. And if you can, just check your torso. If there are any tightness anywhere in there, if there are tightness in your intestines, in your stomach, in your lungs, in any of the organs in your back, in your chest area, people are often teach in cancer associations. Ask people just to be aware of how the body feels. And a lot of times, if there's something in your body feels a little bit strange, unbalanced, just keep your attention there and give it lots and lots and lots of kindness. You might call it kind thoughtness. Mindfulness together with kindness. One thing with mindfulness is it does give, give you feedback. When you change an attitude to something, you just kind and care to it instead of being afraid and controlled. When you're kind to it, you just start to feel more things, less in pain. You can use that to heal the early stage of the cancer, the early stage of any other disease. Focus in the body where you can sense that something's not quite usual. Just feel the kindness. You can talk to the body. You can talk to the, the back, the shoulder muscles. You like these 
bundles and streams, which very often we fall about their own attention, and while we get strong legs, we like strings of guitar, and if they're stretched tight, and something hits it and makes a sound. If you lose some attention, and something hits it, it's a very narrow sound for you. If there's no attention on it at all, it makes no sound at all. It's what we call misnomers. The virus, the bacteria, the wound, the disappointment, the issue. If you are totally at ease, you can have to do it. You can see it. You move from the shoulders and down the arms to the knees, we show the little position. There is no magic position for meditation. Just know that when someone do this meditation, and the posture is the one of the best. What is important though, is you ask your body and respond to it. Who knows how it can sit right now? You go to your face and head, please relax on the muscles around the eyes and the mouth. By doing that, you're also easing off some emotions which can figure those muscles in the face so that you can know if you're afraid, if you're angry, or if you relax. You relax some muscles so the mind can feel some relaxation. Rather than taking each part of the body separately, you notice how the body feels all together as one thing. How relaxed are you? You've been doing this for such a long time. Your body now is very, very relaxed. You just get relaxed and feel this joyful, pleasant feeling. You can hide the relaxed body. And if you can notice that delight, then the body will try to get rid of it. It's a good sign. You can hide the meditation. You can hide the peace. Starting from the psychological view. Once the body is peaceful, you are ready to go to calm your mind. What is your mind to do right now? How peaceful is it? Peace is something that's serious in your mind. You can notice how peaceful it is. You know, being aware of your inner world and the sixth sense of mind. You see, you can contemplate that peace. And you can know peace with it. What is the most in your mind? What makes it not more peaceful? It's the new things, my kindness, my being in slumber. But this world is feeling its death. It's going to be passing. And it goes in past. Kind and pleasant mind. 
imagination. Once you apply to the imagination, you imagine your home in two shopping bags. One in the left hand, one in the right hand. And you go to the end of the day. You've been calling me for a long time. One in the left hand. It has some laughing on the outside. It has the four letters P A S T. Pass. It's a very shocking guy. With many of the things, both good and bad, and what happens to you. And you can be allowed to sit in your own body. And the shocking guy in the left, you are allowed to work at it. The letters on the outside of that are F E T E R E, future. In that is all your hopes and dreams and fantasies and fears and anxieties. All the plans you carry around in the future. You've been holding that for a long time too. You wonder if your arms ache and your shoulders ache. Imagine your shopping bag in your left hand, the past. Imagine slowly lowering that to the ground. You release the ground. All the way it disappears. It allows you to reach your hand away from the hand of the bag. So the left hand, arm, the shoulder can relax. And you just go down the path for a few minutes. And then you are aware of the shoulder bag in the right hand, carrying the future. And you slowly run that down to the floor. And that makes the ground all the way to action from broken goes. And you move your arm hand up by the side. So it too can relax and recover. And look down. You have these two bags. And also you take them away. The two bags on either side of you, the past and the future. And you put them down. You have no further. Instead, you're standing in this beautiful place between the past and the future, called the present. These bags are safe. Just put them down for a few moments. And take the rest. Because you can see them. And you pick them up again later on. And find them lighter. You feel lighter. Because the food which carries them. Your arms. They're resting. And you can go into your past and future for a few minutes. Your mind becomes stronger because you can relax. You find some peace. What does that feel like? Yeah, the English meditation. This notice how more peaceful you feel inside when you began. How more relaxed is your body for when you started. Meditation does have an effect. And you notice that effect. And meditation becomes such a valuable use of your body. And you live in your memory. And now, we go to the eyes and finish the meditation. Thank you.
to the office because people were afraid of identity fraud. I don't know why they're afraid of identity fraud. You know, I'm not, you don't believe in identity. Identity view is one of the hindrances which stop you being speaking now. So anyway, I had to make an appointment. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but when I went to the office there, I had to make an appointment with this Australian woman and said, uh, we've got to find out you know, who you are. Can you prove who you are? And I said to her, I've been a monk for over 40 years. For 40 years I've been trying to find out who I am. <laughs> It's amazing these people who work for you know, the government, they don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> but this is serious. I need some proof of your identity. Can I see your driver's license? And my mom doesn't have a driver's license. I don't drive. Can we see your credit card? <laughs> I don't have a credit card. See your bank account details. I don't have a bank account. See your rental agreement. I don't rent. Or your home ownership certificate or whatever it is. I don't have that either. Because we don't have sort of ownership like that. Okay, can I see your marriage license? He <laughs> <laughs> asked that. I'm not making that up. Well, they asked all these other things, which I just don't have. It's a mark. So they looked at me. He said, you don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, I said, Sounds like the Buddha was right. <laughs> so I proved on some. At least, you know, the government agencies. But it's a bit of good fun. I do have actually two passports. And you're only supposed to accept one of those passports, but they said, that would accept to this occasion just to get rid of you. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> Sometimes I know they're not trying to do anything wrong. The two passports is the one British passport and the one Aussie passport. It's nice to have two passports. I don't have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> Why not? Unfortunately, many allowed three. So which country do you belong to? No, I always say the strange thing. But when the plane lands in Heathrow, I was born here, I grew up here. When I come to England, I feel I'm coming home. And then when the plane goes off to, uh, well, it's going to go to say to Singapore, I've got so many friends and centers in Singapore, I feel like I'm going home. And when it goes to Thailand, I spent nine years of my life in Thailand. When it lands in Bangkok, I feel like I'm coming home. When it gets to Australia, I feel like I'm coming home. It's weird being a monk, because you don't belong anywhere. That's good to come here. So, it's really weird when you know, where do you belong? Each one of you, all each one of them. The wonderful time of our world now, the wonderful time of our uh, existence in the 2020s, where do you belong? Where is your home? Your home is basically where every your friends are. Where the people are, when you see them, they smile at you, you smile at them. And you feel that you're in a place which is safe, which is kind, which is looking after you. And what comes to my mind now, because at the beginning of this talk, you know, I insisted on the bound to the Buddha statue of retirement. You know, it's not that the Buddha statues. It's almost like an obsession, a fiction for me. And that sometimes people ask, what are you doing when you bow to a Buddha statue? And this was really important many years ago. When I gave a talk at one of the top Christian schools, Anglican schools uh, in Australia, it was a Christchurch grammar school. 
And the reason I came to talk there is because I think it's really important if you're a religious leader, don't just talk with your friends, otherwise you just get a narrow view of spirituality. Have some idea of what other people are thinking, what other religions are doing. So for many years I cultivated a very good relationship you know, with other uh, Christian groups and Muslim groups and Jewish groups and Hindu groups over there in Perth, in Western Australia. And so one of my friends, he was a legitimate friend, Father Fanchian, he was a chaplain at this Christian store. So he said, why don't you come and give a talk to the kids at the morning assembly? And straight away, because you're a monk, you get the kids' attention, which is quite an important thing to do, very hard to do for some teachers. So, you get the kids' attention. But I had to wait outside, first of all, uh, with the chaplain and the headmaster. He said, we'll wait until all the children inside to settle, and then we'll go in. And as we go in, the children will sit up. He said, myself and for the chaplain, Frank Sheehan, we'll do a little nod to the statue of Jesus, which is in our school. You know, for this month, you don't need to do that. But when he said that, I decided to show my rebellious side. <laughs> I said, I demand my right to bow to your statue of Jesus. <laughs> and he spent on his face, was very, very strange. He said, why? You're a Buddhist. So I'm a Buddhist, I'm not a Christian. But I can see something in your statue which I can pay respects to. That's what I'm going to bow to. The kindness and compassion which and sometimes we show. This is one of my favorite sayings in the Christian Bible in the Psalms. Be still and know that thou art God. It's not the fact that most people teach on Sunday in churches, the Sunday is going right, be still. You know that this is an ultimate in that. It's meditation. But anyhow, so when I was inside about to the statue of Jesus, and I gave them a talk on what we do when we bow. For me, it's the qualities in that statue which I admire. We usually bow three times. Oops. <laughs> the first thing which I bow to is my virtue, goodness. Kindness, and how you can trust one another. You know, there's most people here I don't know. And I left my shoes outside. You know that sometimes I'm well enough known now, I've got enough disciples, that sometimes people can auction those shoes. <laughs> now, one of my meditation cushions, which I was sitting on for a couple of years. I think that was Homestead for 50,000. <laughs> I have to make sure my meditation cushion is put in the safe. And I did actually just. It did actually just. Uh, uh, it wasn't actually altered for that much. We had a teddy bear auction today, didn't we? A little teddy bear raised 1,500 pounds for our camper. It's a wonderful thing to do. It's just an excuse to make a donation. I think that's not worth that much. But nevertheless, just the kindness of people is worth it. It's wonderful to see. But anyway, so that uh, trust that you have in people, the honesty, the virtue, the knowing that you can trust somebody that will never do anything wrong. And this is a Buddhist temple. It's one of the most meaningful and valuable. Hankers in their paintings, and the, I don't know if that's real crystal, I don't know what it is. They're very, very, probably very expensive. But it's wonderful that people will never steal it. They're kind, you can trust people. When I see that virtue in action, 
that it makes me feel this world is not such a bad place. It's a very good place. There's so many kind people. And because of that, I find it very easy to bow my head to virtue, to goodness, to honesty, to truth. What I'm doing, I'm putting that off myself. I want you this. I find worth in virtue. The second bow is to peace. There are peace. It's not just peace in my meditation. Peace in you know, my family, in my surroundings in which I live. There's no peace in the monastery, the temple, peace in the world. Peace is gorgeous, it's wonderful, it's beautiful. And that's why I bow my head to peace. I find worth in it, that's why I worship it. And the last bow I do when I bow to the Buddha statue, it should be really wisdom, but I prefer kindness. Every time I see an act of kindness, an act of compassion, it just brings so much light into the world, so much joy. It makes London, it's not like a cold, dark metropolis. It makes it look like a, like a beautiful place where people can be kind to one another. I don't know if you've seen an act of kindness today. If you have, it just makes the whole street light up. And that's one of the reasons why the kindness is so valuable. You don't have to be a Buddhist to be kind. You know, even to Buddhists. Buddhists are great. Because you can be kind to them, and it's why they tell them, give us no space to work. That's one of the reasons why we can learn so much in Boston or not. There was this one story in the old man in the United States somewhere. When the woman came home and did her weekly shopping, and so her hands were full of shopping bags. She opened up the door, and this dog ran into her house. It's like an apple dog, a very lovely dog. But she didn't know that dog, she didn't know who owned it, but it ran right into her house, and she couldn't stop it because the hands were full of shopping bags. And they, she put the shopping bags down in the kitchen, went looking for this dog, and she found the dog curled up in the corner of the room, stupid. It was so cute. So she said, well, it's not going to be hard. It's a nice dog. So she let it sleep there, even though she didn't know who owned the dog. And after about an hour, the dog sort of stood up, then looked to the lady, didn't even go up, and so she let it out. And it sort of ran away. And the same thing happened the next day, around the same time. The dog came into the house, went to sleep in the corner. And then, after an hour, went away again. And after three or four days, the same thing happened. She got so interested. Who is this dog? Who is this dog? I don't know this dog. Why is it coming into my house? It's a lovely dog. And so she was very smart. She decided on a wonderful plan. On a piece of paper, she wrote that this dog has been coming to my house every day around this time, sleeping for an hour. I don't know who it is, it's very welcome, but I just want to find out what's it coming to my house. She wrote a piece of paper, folded a piece of paper up, and put a piece of paper in the dog's collar. And when the sort of dog got up and went away, they thought this man will tell the owner what he's talking up to. The dog came the next day and had a different piece of paper in his collar. The answer. And the answer said, this is my dog. We live a couple of blocks away. And in my house, we have, you know, both the husband and wife, he was the husband, he said, the wife is always talking, and the kids are always playing, and they're always shouting and messing around, and especially the young kid is always trying to play with this dog. And it's such a noisy, busy house. The dog is coming to your place with some peace and quiet. <laughs> and the husband says, Can I come too? You can understand that one would like to have a nice dog, and that would be great if an hour sleeping in your house. You can understand what's going on there. 
But this is actually where we can learn that God's good sense for the family is trustworthy. Little acts of kindness by like that, just as you can go stupid your place for an hour. Beautiful story, the kindness and acceptance. And that's why that compassion and kindness is something so easy to balance it. But I tell people in Australia, and Australia is not a very religious country, what they usually worship is cricket and sport. <laughs> And anything to do with the ball. <laughs> but, then I explained to me that's why we do well. We're actually reinforcing the importance of our virtue, peace, and compassion. When I told that you know, to this Australian Catholic leading, so not Catholic, he was Anglican, leading Christian. He was so impressed. He came to the monastery where I was, which is about an hour's drive, he was taking the place. And he came to the shore of his shrine, he had a big book statue there. And without even to ask him, he was sitting next to me, we both bowed to the big statue. He was a very senior Christian, he did not bow. He understood what we do this for. To virtue, peace, and compassion. Something we can all agree So sometimes we're not letting go of our religion. Sometimes we're letting go of some of those past religions which are not sort of fundamental, essential to the teachings, which actually can separate us. And that's something which I don't see the need for separation. There are some very good people and kind of people as well. There's another person who I got to be very friendly with, who was a Catholic. There's only one other monastery in Perth, which is a Benedictine monastery. And so that, you know, when I wanted to get some more information about monastery business, uh, Abbot's business, I'm an Abbot, he was an Abbot, so we used to have meetings to discuss secret Abbot business. <laughs> I remember going to his mansion, it's one of the earliest buildings in Australia. And in his monastery, it was so old that when we were walking through, I couldn't resist but ask him, in your monastery, are there any ghosts? And he said, I'm a Catholic. A Catholic, we don't believe in ghosts. And I told him, what about the Holy Ghost then? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, we got it again. <laughs> so we had a, a wonderful relationship there. And I value that. We can play the one more in the huge talks and different venues. This particular time, it was in our local university. It was a chaplaincy conference. And I noticed that one of the people in the audience, he was quite a well known intellectual in Australia. He was so well known that he was asked by the Australian government to lead a group which was going to rewrite the Australian Constitution's uh, human rights clauses. They were very political and very important. And he was the one who was leading this group. So when he asked me a question, I realised I can't tell you jokes now. Is that serious? And he asked me one of the questions which I think many of you may be asked if you come to a Buddhist temple or you call yourself a Buddhist and you're a Buddhist practitioner. He asked, what's the Buddhist conception of God? And he was asking with humility, he wasn't trying to uh, challenge me. So I wasn't going to ask him in the usual way that Buddhism doesn't accept the existence of a creator God. That would just be sent taking the conversation nowhere. But instead I said, this other abbot, which I've known for many years, one of the things he keeps on saying, I said, first of all, he said, I just don't believe in it. 
when the electron side participated in this, he said, then it did see long. He said, he was invited to say, everybody was searching for God. You probably heard people say that before. But instead of rejecting what he said, I wanted to take it further. What about all the Buddhists who try and die? What about all the atheists? What about the people who have uh, other religions? What are you researching? Why did you come to this talk this evening? What would you like to gain from this talk? And I started with a whole series of things which then Buddhists search for. One of the things is respect. Each one of you, no matter what your gender specification, what your age, what your um, uh, infirmities, if you want to call it that, you want to be respected. We try our best. Sometimes it's difficult to, to achieve what other people achieve. And that's one thing we love, respect. It's one thing which I remember just when I respected as a school teacher and then as an abbot, respected the people I taught. Then they actually lived up to that respect. And the weird thing, if you try and disagree with somebody, they usually find ways of not getting caught and avoiding the discipline. If you put speed cams on the roads, you find out where they are. And slow down to the speed camps. I don't know why they call speed camps up in the UK. It's in the traffic jams. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, but instead of so having punishments, fines, we have trust instead. And surely in the Buddhist monastery, um, the monks or monks, surely that trust will more than it does. Beautiful to see. A good example of that, I told the story earlier today. There was one of my trainees over in Perth. And being a trainee before you become a monk, you have to keep what we call precepts. One of those precepts is not eating anything in the afternoon, in the evening, or night time, then eat in the morning times. And this young Australian, he was waiting for me early in the morning. He said, I need to talk with you. It's important. What is it? He said, He hadn't slept all night. Why? He said, Because yesterday evening, he put his head down. Yesterday evening, I was hungry. And I snuck into the kitchen. And I made myself a sandwich. And I ate it. <laughs> I feel so guilty. And my response as a Buddhist monk, as a leader of that monastery, was thank you for telling me. Now, number one, I try to eat more at lunchtime. Number two, there's all these allowables that you can eat in the evening as a monk. Things like chocolate, <laughs> cheese, and honey, and fruit juice, and carrot juice. There's a whole, well, we call it chicken cabinet, I think you can eat. So in there, instead of making yourself a sandwich, and I said, you can go now. And he said, I'm going to punish you. He said, no, we don't do punishments. If you, and this is what you've done, you want to see, and you try to do better next time. The Buddha himself said, that's growth. Uh, in the spiritual training. So you go now. He said, no. I need to be punished. <laughs> if you don't punish me, I'll do the same again. I know my character. <laughs> and as it happened, that very morning, I was reading this book. It was about the early settlements in Australia when the British would send the convicts to Australia and when the head of convicts did anything wrong they were flogged very brutally 
with this instrument they call the Cat of Nine's House. That's the rest of my life. So this young Australian Arsenal High School. I say, well, the typical Australian punishment for you will be 50 strokes of the cat. And this, this young man, his face went white. He was supposed to be wearing white clothes when he came back to his head. His face went black and white in his face. <laughs> oh my goodness, that young man was going to whip me. <laughs> <laughs> But then I explain what 50 strokes of the cat means in a Buddhist temple. We have two cats resident. <laughs> Find one of them and stroke it. One, two, <laughs> That's called 50 strokes of the cat. You have to learn some compassion and kindness so you don't feel you can punish it. Those are the wonderful little teachings of the importance of such kindness and compassion. But anyway, uh, this, uh, when I was asked, you know, uh, what are Buddhists searching for? What are atheists searching for? Respect is one of those. Kindness. Can someone be kind to you today? How beautiful that is when someone thinks about you. They look after you. They don't need to do that, they just do it. It makes your day a very beautiful, happy day. Mm-hmm. You no know, need to be loved to experience such love. I don't mean the love of attachment and control, but just the love of giving. As they say, one of the things we child, like a mother loves her only child. Cares for them. Mm-hmm. Who is interested in what they do? Not controlling them. Just wants to give to them. Mm-hmm. I remember one of the relations I really loved a lot was my grandma. Now, she didn't have an accent. That's the worst of it. But I loved my grandma so much because I could go to her house any time of the day or night and she would fry me some chips. <laughs> <laughs> any time. And my mother used to say to my grandma, and her mom, said, why are you giving him chips? He's going to have dinner tonight. And my grandma would say, if my grandson wants chips, he gets chips. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> I've never been had a grandma like that, or grandpa like that. He's not good for that. He never do it. Anyone who thinks, I don't know, you don't know. Do <laughs> no. This is not my suicide belt. <laughs> yes, I've been a monk now 48 years, I've been a monk. A long time. And every year, you are a monk. Or a nun, every year, your heart gets bigger. You can't. Many years ago, <laughs> my heart was so big, it was pushing against my lip cage. <laughs> yeah, no, I was to go except down. <laughs> <laughs> this is a big heart. <laughs> it's not that. That's why I stayed away. Anyway, so that's, um, what, are you, what are you searching for? What would you like to have? Peace, forgiveness, humanity, warmth, sense of stillness, sense of peace, peace. You can add many of those things. The spiritual things we kind of searching for. And I said, well, if everyone is searching for God, and that's the spiritual things we don't know everyone searches for, that's the spiritual things. Peace, stillness, kindness, forgiveness. What would be the qualities? So I said I feel like that would put a statue for the qualities of that is obvious. And it makes it very easier and very more profound the way you do that art and feel those things. And they become more important in your life. What are you doing there? You're not doing so letting go. 
Let me tell us some of the similar ideas which cause barriers between us and cause this blocks so we don't even listen to one another. One of those groups of people I learned so much from in my life were the people in jails. One of the great privileges I had is to be able to go and visit uh, people in prisons. I was asked by a prisoner, the prisoner got a telephone call to me, and he said, is that you guys have arms in He said, you wouldn't believe how many weeks and I said, a couple of months is taken to make this call to you. He said, but please, can you come to our jail and teach? So of course I did. I believe it was true. But every time I went into a prison, it was strange. I never saw a criminal at all. I never saw a murderer. I never saw a thief. I never saw a rapist. I never saw a cheat. All I ever saw when I went into prison was a person who killed. I saw a person who stole. I see people who raped. They are not rapists. Aren't you stupid as what you do? Does that define who you are? Of course it doesn't. Because of that, when I could see the other part, I most mostly you know, because the wood is out. But mostly then, when I saw the good part in those people in jail, so could they. Because they could see what I could see, then they had an opportunity. The good part of them to grow and flourish. I remember teaching the meditation retreat over in Paris, where I live. And it was hard to get a cook for that meditation retreat. So I never told our Buddhist society who were organizing this retreat, nor did I tell uh, the people who booked onto this retreat. I managed to get a cook from our local prison. From the prisoners. He was such an amazing cook. He would come there early in the morning cook amazing food. He would do these pizzas. He'd make anything himself and tell he would make himself. Just that day, it was so incredibly fresh and delicious. He put so much care and love into those pizzas and everything else which he did. And a huge amount of food for the people on the street. He was such a kind character that people you know, got to love him. And his name was Carl. And at the end of the retreat, the people who were on the retreat said, Can we thank Carl? Where's he gone? Can you ask him to come back just to meet us so we can say thank you for all our service he gave? I said, no, He's at the prison, I'm right. <laughs> He's in prison for multiple weeks. When I said that, the people were shocked. All the important, I trusted him 100%. And he gave me a wonderful job. And people could see that sometimes you can judge a person far too quickly. Yes, he did do rape a couple of times early on in his life. Mostly because he was, he was under the influence of very strong drugs. He didn't come at it. He gave that up, trying to do his very best. And he was so thankful that someone trusted him and gave him a chance. He lived up to that. And now he's married, got a beautiful wife, having a wonderful time, uh, doing well in his life. He was always very grateful that someone could say he wasn't a rapist, he was a person who was early part of his life who done away. Of course, that's a lot of things to pay back 
So this would be where we have an opportunity to live a beautiful life afterwards. So this is one of the things which we want to not to judge yourself or judge others so easily. Please let go of some of those judgments. Some of the people are stupid things, especially when they're young. I don't know if the last time I was here, I made my confessions. I think Many, many years ago, <laughs> oh, many years ago, I spent some of the most wonderful hours of my life in the loving arms of another man's wife. We kissed, we hugged, we loved each other. She was married to another man. Is that bad? That was my mom. She was married to my dad. She was another man's wife. And I mentioned that story, how easy it is for us to judge and get the wrong, the wrong information. It's the right information, but we misinterpret it. That's one of the reasons why we're very careful in judging others. See if they go with that in mind. Keep yourself in mind. You never know who people are. If you trust the person, a lot of times they will trust you. They want to live up to that trust, especially those people that are in jail. Simply because the trust was such a bad thing for them to feel. And they did feel it. They wanted it. They never wanted it to die. I did get one of the, the best accolades I've ever had in my life. Best piece of praise. And I share this with you because it was a rare thing. It was a prison officer who called me one day. He said, I want you to come back to my prison to teach. I said, I'm too busy. I got a counter, uh, the Buddhist temple, the government thing. I was overseas. <laughs> and they said, I said, I sent somebody else. He said, No, we want you. Why? And this was the phrase which I'll never forget. He said, Because I've been in this prison for most of my working life. I'm on the scene with prison officers. I've noticed that for a number of Buddhists, he said, and I've noticed that all the prisoners who come to your class, when they finish their sentence, they never ever come back again. So it was weird. But somehow there's no recidivism. So I thought I wanted you to come back again, and you say it again. That made me think, why? What have you done there? The people who have you know, these terrible crimes, they really hurt other people. But so once they are free of their sentence, they can make a life for themselves. How about each one of you? You may have known about the war, but sometimes you have great tragedies in your life. Can you let that go? Can you leave? Why is it we always keep holding on to painful experiences in our life? You may have lost someone very close to you. who died. I always remember when my father died. He, he got, I was only 16. In the council flat, in the house, council flat, holding the cost of life and acting. Mother and I, in the middle of the night, can't walk up your bed. So I went into his bed and shook him. He was cold, he was dead. I was only 16. And nevertheless, I made him quiet. I haven't quite seen him since he's dead. I'm quiet, I'm not because my father passed away. He took me a long time to understand my emotions. You know the 16 year old male? You know the time that you have become a mother at that time? You know, I realized how I felt when my father died, and how I felt at his funeral service. 
is so close to another emotion, which I remember from my young years. And that was the emotion I felt at the end of the great concert, in some of the great auditoriums in London, there was the upper hall, a lot marquee coming over street and so on. I know I just met the little chapter quite nervous when I said well it was the very first class in the next level. So if you pleasant you don't like rock music. And then this other performance in the last time. There was a band, none of us six of us turned up watch. None of these singles watched it. A private concert from Sir Martin. It wasn't so at that time. But after all those great concerts, which I enjoyed here in London, and then all those great concerts, I never cried when the concert was over. Even though I knew the chance of listening to that music again was zero. I thought how privileged I was to see someone who would be. Greatest performance in the song and the instruments. How lucky I was to be there at that time. And that's how I felt when my father died. Exactly that. How lucky I was for the last 60 years to summon up for a lot of people. I never had good luck. Never tell us that. I felt privileged. Lucky. That's one of the ways you can let go of some of the suffering of our life. Even though when you do get many of your own sicknesses, when you get close to the end of your life, there's nothing wrong with you too. I must say this every time you are sick, life on earth is a Buddhist. Why do you go to see your doctor? and say there's something wrong with me, I'm sick. That's not good, that's not a dharma. You are for some sort of complaint, some of us. Please go and see your doctor and say there's something right with me. I'm sick again. Please don't discriminate against sickness. Sickness is okay, it's part of the healing process. So please tell your doctors next time. Something wrong with me again, Doc. I'm sick again. <laughs> that means you will be more sensitive to your body. You won't be afraid of it. You won't um, devalue what we call sickness. It's going to be much easier to heal. When it does happen, you die. Please die well. It's going to come sooner or later. But when it comes, let go of all the concerns you've done so much for me in your life. So I can't really just let go. Bye bye, I'm dying, still in touch. <laughs> but what's even more important is when somebody else in your life is dying. Mm-hmm. I've seen this many, many, many times. I've participated in this many times. A good example is this nurse, Jenny, and her husband, Steve. They had this beautiful lifestyle where Jenny was a nurse, he was a white water rafter, and he formed this little company taking people to some of the most beautiful parts of the world through white water rafting. He made quite a bit of money out of that. But even though he was young, his thirties, he got cancer. And the cancer just was very, very aggressive. And even though his wife was a nurse, nothing could save him. He was dying. And I remember going to visit her and Steve, the husband, many, many times. And even though they said it could be any day now. Many days and not for a couple of weeks. And he did it. He wasn't dying. And then when I went to see him once, 
Yeah, he was all skin and bones as happened to her people had cancer, just in this year. And she was looking after him, just in a clinical setting. And then, you can see, that he wasn't a better crisis situation. She said, I asked Jenny, or Jane, sorry. I asked Jane, have you given your husband permission to die yet? That's one of those magic moments. Most much of the time, I don't tell the time when this really works. Not it doesn't work like that. This one really works. Without even responding to me, Jane jumped up on the bed and put her arms so gently about her husband. He was so weak. No skin and bones, you've never seen that in hospitals. He said, Steve, I love you. I to die. They felt each other so softly and quiet. That evening, Steve passed away. I'm sure you all understand the psychology of that. If that's you who was dying, and the son you love so much, the last thing you ever want to do is hurt them, but it would cause them any sorrow. So the person you love is you who is in the world and frees you. The experiences such as that are always said the greatest act of love and compassion you can ever do is to let someone have. And you don't need to do that. Nothing's happening. So this is how we can let go of our daily life and the life which we live. And can we Times of great things, of great compassion, and free other people. Now is the time for you. Please go on into your next life with my blessing. There is another person like that. When he was in Chitras Monastery some years ago, I knew him very well. He was a known scholar from Oxford. He was a contemporary. Very smart and fit young man. But he got two types of typhoid at the same time in the pilot. He was so sick, he was lucky he got into a bad hockey time and came very close to dying. And then they sent him to the monastery we had in Chitras he could get better treatment. Now, this is what came up with that many years ago. He was staying in the attic. I don't know if you've ever read any of these novels about Jane Eyre. That's where really the attic in these big country houses, that's where you put all the people that are crazy in that. Look at that crazy old man that's costly. In any way, he's not there for a couple of years. He couldn't get out of the door. Because by the time he got up and walked the door, his engine disappeared. And then, the admin monastery then went up to him. He said to him, I come up here on behalf of everybody who knows you and loves you and cares for you. Marks, nuns, family. I come up here to give you permission to die. Stop trying so hard to get better. It's okay to die. And of course, this man, this rose scholar, he burst out crying. He wept. And that's when he started to get better. <laughs> <laughs> he's still alive to tell us. Yeah, the old time, of course. So? Oh, yeah. Just don't get talking about it. Okay, I'm going to do that now. He went to the in South Africa. He started teaching me a fish in that. Who's in the case? Oh my Sorry? Okay, anyway. Well, that was the story many years ago. Just trying to please other people and get better. That stress was keeping me. But sometimes when you do pleasant to die, I don't know what your father was like in life, but some part of us all tried to do the opposite. <laughs> so you can push them and they get the thoughts. <laughs> But anyway, I keep talking too much. So, oh yeah. Uh, 
was the half hour and then so So at least it's time for questions, comments, and complaints. <laughs> 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 so we have a question for Mr. Uh, 
this is where you mark, and we just see the mark now. It's so expressive. No one will ever know if you're stuck with that, is it? So that's the kindness the university can get. So why should you be talking about it? So that's what we're doing here today, is because they're more shallow there. You know, she managed to get her last place. We can start a really project here in the context. I know that I can teach and really people like covers in my teachings, but I also know there are some things which I just can't teach. There's another woman in this world. So I thought, like, oh, so we have one. A little bit of talk. Here we have the great man here, I don't know if there are teachers here. But I have one with the other one as well. Wow. That's prices. Let me do it more fair in our world. Okay, go on. <laughs> <laughs> Work. 
Stillness is what that is for. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to be honest. Yes, of course I do. I'm out of the hole because I can't really see it perfectly still. Has it stopped moving yet? It's moving a bit. Why? So I'm not being mindful. I'm not being mindful. Has it stopped moving yet? No. Because I'm not concentrating. I'm not concentrating and being mindful at the same time. <laughs> now, that's always true. If you concentrate your stillness, your peace, your voice. So, how can I get this tea in this cup to be perfectly still? You put it out. You let it go. You don't hold it. And then, you still? It's <laughs> okay. Now that's the course of demonstration. Because that's actually how I'm going to play. You sit down there, you let things be, you let go. And then everything comes to the start. Really powerful. Yeah, I'm just thinking. Oh, thank you. Okay, then the question is Hi. I'm from the class. You should have been here before this, and when you're trying to meditate, but your brain is stressless. Yeah. Because that happens a lot to me. Okay, now that's such a. Common problem. If your brain is restless, or if your brain is aware of, let that be your meditation object. So, in other words, how can you be restless? You're aware of something, and let that be your main object of meditation. You can't be restless because you think you should be watching your breath, or you think you should be still. You think you should be somewhere else. Wherever you are, make peace with that. And then wherever you are, no restless is anymore. When you're aware of this present moment, when you think you should be somewhere else, you should be thinking about this, you should be thinking about that. You're thinking about this right now, that's the whole of this meditation. This actually came. One of those stories I read as a student, it was a story from the whole story. It was a very famous story of the emperor's three questions. This emperor had up to him politics and religion, so he wanted to find out another way of having a religion, which he could use in his daily life, which made sense to him. Eventually he found that religion was based on the answers to three questions. And those questions were when is the most important time? Who is the most important person? Or what is the most important thing to do? So, if you've heard these questions before, the answers, please shout. <laughs> <laughs> so, the first question when is the most important time? Yeah. Now, yeah, that's the obvious one. Now is the only time we ever have. Now is the time that your future is being made. Right now. Who is the most important person? No, it's not. Okay. The most important person is the one right in front of you. Whoever that happens to be. If you ever had experience when you're talking to somebody, you're trying to get it. This is not easy. They're not giving you any thoughts. Which means they're not learning what you have to say to them. Whoever that happens to be, the one who has stayed with in life, if they're right in front of you, they're the most important person in the whole world. A lot of times, you're not 
very much in all the parts of our family in this house. What is the most important thing to do? His answer is to be kind, to care. No more than that. And that becomes the answer to the other three questions. Now that there must be all time. The one to find is most important for us in the whole world. And the most important for is to care. Now that works out the meditation. Now is every time to act. Whatever you are aware of right now is the most important meditation object ever. So whatever you are thinking, whatever you are aware of, that's what you're supposed to be watching. And how do you watch it? You care. Don't criticize yourself, don't hurt you on yourself, pure yourself. Think through this. Think find the mysticist that you want. Did you see things inside of your life? Just like, how did I get here from Australia, or this was in Africa, when I fly here? I never flew from Perth to London. The plane did the flying. I just sat down on the seat. So I never went anywhere. I just sat down and let the aircraft do the flying. You understand? Is there a question over here? Okay. Hi, uh, this is how you did that. How am I doing? So far, so good. So, um, so my question to you is that uh, I've been very fortunate enough to be told um, special uh, this past year that I've been, I sent uh, my friend very good advice and shown guidance where I'm from. However, uh, I was curious to know how can someone take that advice on themselves? Uh, is we treat others so differently from the way we treat ourselves. That's one of the reasons why it's actually to balance that. I don't know how you got a part in your life. I did, um, I, I, I was, I did have one time, I was very uh, fortunate to have that time with it, however, um, with the problems, I was always there to sort of help them with that. Yeah. However, unfortunately, I kind of lost myself in yeah. not being able to help myself with the thing I was saying. It was almost a kind of practice what you preach. I can be able to do So that's really lucky. You know, mm-hmm. a good example there. The next time you find a partner, don't do marriage blessings with people. Don't do marriage blessings with people. Yes. One of the first things I said, watch. You know, those like the same things go on, there's a great use for another person. From that day on, you must never think of yourself. From that day on, you must never think of your partner. Good, you haven't heard this before, so I can see you in the When you have a relationship like a marriage, you never think of yourself, you never think of your partner. You think of us. The third option which many people miss. We miss together. So if you really care for your partner, you don't care for yourself. The relationship is breathed. You live together. Like the poor lucky animal. And the queen back there is the queen's brother makes a powerful couple of us. This is one of the reasons why I like to sit in the hand. If one finger gets hurt, the whole hand gets infected. So even the little finger has to cut all the other fingers, and these fingers are the carbon fingers too. So we live together. But please, not a people say, good advice to you. Please follow that advice. You have to speak in my teacher. You can't know how to get those out. You become four. 
I know I sort of sometimes try to explain it in a way which you can understand it easily. This is you know, this four of you, the big pile of shits, and you know, no fault. You mean that shit? What do you mean? Quite a lot of this So you get some of the most amazing mangoes. They're so sweet, so many of so delicious. No matter how much it has, it's in the first place, you can't finish that, but you'll never have to see how it's really going. But it does. The magic you get, but it's not as well. So if you have any magic, please give it to me. I'm going to say my book. Um, my question is more around the piece, like how do you encourage parents to instill more mindfulness in the piece, especially if possibly have a done? I think the one thing that she didn't know was this fun lady idea that she wanted to meditate at home, but every time she sat down and closed her eyes, her two young kids would crawl all over her, put her wrong hair. And just do anything to get her attention. So one day, what she did was to say, No, I'm going to meditate no matter what. So she sat down, repeated the usual thing Money, money, I want a glass of water. Money, money, I want to be taken to the cocoon. So she just sat there. So they started putting her there and pouring her over. Money, money, money. And then it's amazing just how kids, how fearless they can become. <laughs> money, 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 Mary's turned on the gas. <laughs> money, money, money. <laughs> Mary is taking the money out of the kids we brought. This is actually helpful, is it? And then she said to herself, I don't care if they go out of the house and have to go to the kids or find my wife. I'm going to carry on and say, yes, you did. And after a little while, the kids went totally quiet. They uh, gassed themselves <laughs> off. <laughs> they did that. <laughs> but after half an hour, she opened her eyes. The two children were playing peacefully in the corner. They hadn't. Tell them the gas. They have to each other. They're just trying to get money's attention. And that day on money, one, how old she was in the And as she crossed her legs, kids knew the money was out of reach for a while. They liked that because I was to the last nice of money while she came out of the day. Okay. Okay, go. Yeah. How do you make peace with the present moment when it's overwhelming? Where is overwhelming? It's already here. Overwhelming and not overwhelming is calm. So you've got no choice. You make peace with it. And you find a lot of times that we have overreacted. In the present moment. You look at it at one time, it's huge. But after a while, it's not overwhelming at all, it's got back its normal size again. And many forces for things being overwhelming. Once when I was very tired as a monk, I meditated in the, the jungle alone. Now in that jungle, there's so many, many, many dangerous animals. Would eat monks. <laughs> and so I remember sitting down meditating and I heard the sound of an animal coming towards me in the jungle. And straight away I thought, is that big animal or small animals? Only small animals, they're not dangerous. So I carried on my meditation nice and peaceful. But then as it came closer to me, it started much bigger than I could first assess. You know, you could hear the twigs being blown 
Det er bare, at man er her, og man får det sådan en afslags, så man skal blive det her. Men det er bare, at man ser et kærlighedsstand, så det skal jo nok hænge os. Men hvis det kan ikke kræve sig, så kan det være det rigtigt. Hvis du får det svore, så kan man huske, at det er det bare. Og jeg tager her. Jeg tager det ud af det, jeg tager det. Well, that was my eyes. I had a flash light. It was so overwhelming sound. This is what could have my life. So I was so scared. And I looked at my flash light around and I saw it. She was a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> it really shocked me because I thought I was being mindful. I was very much in this moment. But the fear made a small mouse sound like a tiger. But I don't think it's best to do that. Is it really overwhelming? Or are you adding to it something which you didn't even deserve? That's one of the reasons why it's great to go to Buddhist temples. Great to go to the place where they have a cup of bikini, or get calcium, or so. You just go there and you just give you a and feel great to see these in the country of my eyes. Now okay, it's okay. Okay. Uh, actually my question is that uh, uh, that is something that's uh, that's a good prayer as far as and how is it possible that no one of that is equal to the solar source of the how is So it could be a creation. Could you repeat the question? Yes, so if uh, that is a result of uh, previous good karma, then how is it possible that from the wealthiest people in the world could be so as Okay, yes. So what happens is, I think that's quite true. But if you are wealthy in this life, it's because of probably some good karma you did in your previous life. But then you have this beautiful thing called love. You don't know how to lose it. In other words, we call it in our next life. The reason the Buddha said that people are wealthy is because they were generous in the previous life. They didn't just spend the wealth for themselves. They gave it to good charities where they could make a difference in this world. And many people like that who give money just to uh well, that guy who gave a big donation to the people who would have been crying. Oh no, it wasn't as far as somebody else, but anyway. But anyway it wasn't the Elon Musk. It wasn't Elon Musk, no. <laughs> 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 You see sometimes that it's like, you know, you did a lot of charity and goodness and kindness in your previous life. And you gave money, not just to make you thank for yourself. And then because of the goodness of your past life, it's like you make enough good karma so that you make money in the next life quite easily. And it gives you an opportunity to make use of that money wisely. Kindly, compassionately, in the end of this life. If you go, you'll be born again. This way is a test. You know how to use wealth. You tell them you can have wealth. And so many other people can tell you how to use it here to me, here to my temple, here to this place. It's a huge responsibility. It's not a blessing. But sometimes people know how to use that lesson. When we see that, it's one of the wonderful things. So people that do have wealth, they have such wonderful things for people in their life. At the end of their life, they feel as if their life will end. They probably do well for the next life as well. And sometimes people get, you see, ego gets in the way, the sense of the self, how wealthy they are. I have debt with everybody else. And we see that with the narcissist services in some of the people. In other words, we see that even more often. 
Eu sou de justificação da pessoa. It's on that subject, there's a little story I often tell. There's uh, a question that somebody asked the Buddha. He said, well, why are some people wealthy? No matter how much we work, we still be poor. Why? It's because they want James to bring his life. He also said, why are some people beautiful and other people just ugly? It doesn't matter how many times you go to have facelifts, <laughs> you go to spas, you still like me. <laughs> Why? When I told this story in Singapore once, I was in really big trouble. Because <laughs> when I went to the word ugly, I just had to be looking at some people. <laughs> Oh, you're very happy. Why are you saying happy when you look at me? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the very beautiful um, ask of the is when you're kind. You can be really kind in the past life, you will be beautiful in yourself. You make the kind face. The last question is um, how do you become wise? Intelligent. You may have kids, this may happen to you yourself. You know, you try to do well in the exams, you know, you go to university. And some people have to work so hard to get a degree. So the other one, they just go there and play around all the time, they still get the best marks at university. It's really unfair. So what is the common cause for intelligence in your next life? The common cause for intelligence in your next life is asking questions in this life. Yes, oh yeah. Oh yeah, what are you? Also maybe this is almost the last question because we have to be out of here by eight o'clock. No, 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 no. Stop at eight thirty. Eight thirty nine. What are your thoughts on euthanasia? Okay, first of all, the joke. Euthanasia is not the problem. We use the word of the world. No, euthanasia, as long as it's voluntary euthanasia. Voluntary euthanasia is just your choice. And you are not uh, forced or not um, influenced by other people. It's your little free choice. So that you think that now is the time to end your own life. It has to be for decent reasons as well. Not just because you're suicidal, but because you've got these terrible illnesses, which are no real prospect. Of being here, and you feel that this is the best thing you can do. That is your free choice. Yes. Um, so, what about like uh, advising uh, what you need to ask for animals? Okay, for animals, you're called it. It is the animal's choice. Mm -hmm. Now, what I mean by that, I don't spend the time in the tissue which we use and see how it works. It may be like a dog or a cat. It is part of your family. You've known them for so many years. You know they've got some cancer, some terrible disease, but it's going to be really young. And the vet says, 
how the agent goes in town. You have to be off the farm to a story of the other reserves. Story of the other reserves. We can argue that they're having that. So, what we do is we hold that cat that dog in your arms. Why do we? We ask that cat, Have you had enough? Do you need to die now? And that is the cat which you love, or dog which is feeding your family for such a long time. You will know the answer almost immediately. The story I often tell is this lady. She had a, a dog. She spent so much money trying to cure it of the cancer. And eventually, it told us that. Uh, she to go I'm not sure what it was. Thank you for coming. Anyway, that the. Uh, one way the cat said that there's no more opportunity to cure it if you still have this suffering. And he told the mission, so I injected it into it. And she remembered my teachings. She told that God helped me with his body in the life. So it was his simple. But she held her dog. She loved so much. Don't take your eyes and say, when you have life, you ought to die now. She got a very, very clear message back. No. Oh, and so she told her that, no, I'll not allow my dog to be nice. I said, we are. The vet said, you Buddhist, you say you're compassionate and kind, that dog is suffering. She said, oh, well, I'll take you home. And the vet was just really angry. I was very bossy for cool Buddhist. Six months later, she took the dog back into the vet. It was a whole mission. The cats were gone. You know, back and check that dog. Wow, who told us to so wise? <laughs> <laughs> Please, don't underestimate the wisdom. Is that big enough for you to ask them? Ask them. Please go. Oh, what about the karma of the vet? Karma of the vet's karma. It's not the only thing that the dog of cats karma. You're just conveying what cats wishes to someone who can help them. That's the dog of the cats karma. It's not your job. And that's not that hard to do. All you need to do is to be sensitive, listen, and trust. You know what happens. Okay, so again, people are reminding me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we have to exit the premises by 8 o'clock. <laughs> a, a, a higher time ends at half past eight, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, okay, so thank you all for coming today. Thank you all for listening. If you want to know anything more about the Anakin Liberty Project, the packers are over there. Thank you for coming.